make a note right here. Hang on a second. I can. Uh, which ones are they? I'm sorry. <coughs> what, what pages are we on? Tell was neither. Okay. okay, then Lamanowitz. Okay, that's Bonnie. I got it. That's all I need, guys. Lamanowitz. Yeah. And then you can make. Do you have a value on him? Give it up. I have it. Okay, so those are Jersey Cobra. Okay, I'm going to pay 
Committee on Homeland Security, Subcommittee on Transportation and Protective Security will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to examine the existing security measures that safeguard surface transportation systems and identify ways that the federal government can help state and local transit agencies protect their enormous ridership. I'd like to thank the City of Trenton and the City Council for allowing us to have this very important hearing in these beautiful historic chambers. This is an official congressional hearing, and as such, we must abide by the rules of the Committee on Homeland Security and the House of Representatives. I kindly wish to remind the guests today that demonstrations from the audience, including applause and verbal outbursts, as well as any use of signs or placards, are a violation of House rules. It is important that we respect the decorum and the rules of this committee. I've also been requested to state that photography and cameras are, are limited to access, access by accredited press only. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. I'm very pleased to be joined today by two hometowners here, or close to being hometowners, Ranking Member Bonnie Watson Coleman and Congressman Fitzpatrick, to discuss a topic that is vital to the safety and economic vitality of the Northeast region and the greater United States. I applaud the ranking member for her hard work and dedication to Homeland Security, and it is an honor to be here today in your district to hear directly from both your, your um, UN uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick's constituents on how to better secure the transit systems. Mass transit is critical to the livelihood of many Americans and provides an integral backbone to the backbone, backbone of this economy. Uh, recent terror attacks like the one in Brussels that targeted an international airport and a metro station have made us more cognizant than ever of the vulnerabilities in our transportation systems. Surface transportation systems are a very attractive target due to their large volume of daily ridership and open infrastructure. Mass transit systems face unique challenges in screening passengers, closing resource gaps, and targeting assistance <coughs> from the Department of Homeland Security. To put this into context, surface transportation modes serve over 10 billion riders annually, compared to an average of 800 million U.S. aviation passengers a year. That's more than 12 times the number of people that fly or, or take part in mass transit other than flying. And it's our duty to ensure that local stakeholders and law enforcement have the resources they need to keep their riders and their systems safe. The purpose of today's hearing is to assess our ability and readiness to detect and disrupt threats to our nation's critical surface transportation systems. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the current threat landscape, as well as the effectiveness of established security measures. Surface transportation systems are largely owned and operated by state and local entities, further complicating the Department of Homeland Security's responsibility as a primary federal agency responsible for securing the numerous and diverse modes of transit. These systems are difficult to secure due to their open infrastructure, multiple access points, hubs serving multiple carriers, and in some cases, lack of access barriers. Additionally, considering the significant volume of daily ridership via surface transportation modes, <coughs> delays or system shutdowns in response to threats can cripple the local economy. <coughs> the multi-layer security approach at airports, including advanced passenger screening, metal detectors, x-ray machines, and advanced imaging technology, explosive detection canines, and armed law enforcement personnel cannot be easily replicated in the surface transportation sector. The delays and costs associated with measures would undermine the affordability and expediency of mass transit. Easy accessibility and relative affordability are part of what makes mass transit and rail transportation so popular among the American public and help keep our local, regional, and national economies humming. However, these benefits can also be exploited by terrorists as inherent vulnerabilities in surface transportation. Because of the difficulties associated with security screening people and goods on a train, metro, or bus, intelligence sharing deterrence and detection measures, as well as modern technology, are extremely important. The security of a transit environment that spans multiple geographic jurisdictions and that integrates multiple law enforcement agencies depends upon seamless <coughs> interagency coordination. All of you were invited here today because you are on the front lines, and your firsthand knowledge and expertise is going to be invaluable to us. I look forward to hearing from all of you about how the federal government can better coordinate with state and local, state and local surface transportation partners and law enforcement personnel to protect the traveling public, despite the fact that I understand that some of you are Philadelphia Eagles fans, and I'm a New York Giants fan, but we'll have to deal with that as we go. 
I now recognize uh, uh, the ranking member, uh, Ms. Watson Coleman, for her, for her opening statement. Uh, good morning. I would like to thank Chairman Katko for agreeing to hold this hearing today in the capital city of New Jersey, Trenton, New Jersey. I'd also like to thank Mr. Fitzpatrick for traveling to my district to join us as we seek to better understand how the federal government can partner more effectively and make our surface transportation and public areas more secure. <coughs> Before I turn to the subject at hand, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our hosts the, uh, here at City Hall who went the extra mile to help ensure that we have a successful hearing. And I particularly like to uh, acknowledge the president of our city council, Mr. Zachary Chester, for being here this morning. Thank you. The 12th Congressional District of New Jersey in which we sit today is connected by a complex web of transit systems. Every day, thousands of passengers pass through my district on New Jersey transit, SEPTA, and Amtrak trains. The safe and secure operation of transit systems is essential to the social and economic well-being of the people I serve. Their ability to travel safely depends upon the security efforts of today's panelists who face a daunting task. The terrorists have targeted soft targets, such as subways, mass transit stations, and public airport areas in the United States and abroad. Last year, just up the road in Elizabethtown, five pipe bombs were found near a transit station and one exploded as police were attempting to disarm it. Thankfully, there were no injuries, but the need to protect against threats to these systems is very clear. The emergence of a class of would-be terrorists who with little to no training, financial support, or direction carry out crimes of opportunity against innocent people <coughs> demands greater vigilance and collaboration at all levels of government. Securing these critical transportation systems requires a layered, risk-based, well-resourced -re approach. Unfortunately, the budget that president, uh, the president has proposed for fiscal year 2018 goes <coughs> in the opposite direction and calls for draconian cuts to almost every relevant federal program. Last year, the president of the American Public Transit Association testified before a Senate subcommittee that transit agencies across the United States had identified $6 billion in capital and operational security needs. Yet, the president wants to cut the Transit Security Grant Program, the primary source of federal security funds for most transit agencies, from $88 billion to just $48 billion. He also is proposing significant cuts to the TSA's Visible Intermodal Prevention and Response Program, also known as VIPER. Under this program, TSA officials, federal air marshals, and canine teams partner together with the transit police and other local law enforcement <coughs> to carry out security operations within surface transportation systems and public airport areas. Under the President's budget, the number of Viper teams would drop from 31 teams to eight. Finally, the President is proposing a complete elimination of law enforcement officer reimbursement program. Under this critical program, local law enforcement agencies receive partial federal reimbursement for deploying officers at airports. In 2017, the program was funded at $44 million. The cuts that the President is seeking would come at the cost of the security of transportation systems in the 12th Congressional District and across this country. Later today, when we return to Washington, I will be introducing a bill to push back against these reckless cuts. My legislation, known as the Surface Transportation and Public Area Security Act of 2017, seeks to not only secure, revamp, and resource important programs aimed at securing critical soft targets, but also greatly enhances federal partnership with federal, state, and local stakeholders to protect those vital systems and the people who use them. In addition to authorizing $400 million for the Transit Security Grant Program, directing TSA to maintain 60 Viper teams and restoring funding for law enforcement officer reimbursement programs, my bill would also make law enforcement reimbursement available for surface transportation, increase the deployment 
of explosive detection canines to circus transportation require a review of whether it is appropriate for people to be able to carry guns into public transportation areas and direct the dissemination of best practices for securing <laughs> against vehicle-based attacks, such as the attack we witnessed recently in New York. <clears throat> a bill focused on securing these aspects of our transportation system is long past due. Today's hearing is a great opportunity to start a meaningful conversation and about how we can work together to make these systems more <coughs> secure. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about their security needs and how we can be helpful. And again, I thank my colleagues for joining me here today in Trenton and hope for a productive discussion today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance. Thank you, Ms. Watson Coleman. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We are pleased to have a group of distinguished witnesses before us today to speak on this timely and important topic. Let me remind the witnesses that their entire written statements will appear in the record. Our first witness is Mr. Charles Cunningham, the Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for the De Delaware River Port Authority. Mr. Cunningham previously served in the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I was a federal organized crime prosecutor for 20 years, so I like you guys. And more recently was a National Account Regional Manager at Allied Universal. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Cunningham to testify for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Chairman Katko, Ranking Member Watson Coleman, uh, and Congressman uh, Fitzpatrick. Thank you for inviting me to discuss security at PACO and Delaware River Port Authority. <coughs> Joining me today is William Shanahan, Director of Government Relations and Grant Administration at the Delaware River Port Authority and Chair of the Philadelphia Area Regional Transit Security Working Group, Parts Week. Before joining the DRPA PACO in August 2017 as the Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, I served as a Special Agent in Charge of the Richmond Division of the FBI and was responsible for national security crisis response counterterrorism investigations threats throughout the state of Virginia. I oversaw the dir <clears throat> and directed the Virginia Joint Terrorism Task Force as well as counterintelligence matters. During my 22-year career in, in the FBI, I also served as a chief of organized crime uh, of <clears throat> and chief of violent crime for the Bureau. Before joining the FBI, I served as a police officer in Montgomery County in Pennsylvania and four and a half years as a Pennsylvania State Trooper. And I am proud to have served honorably in the United States Air Force. I'm responsible for the physical security of the DRPA PATCO assets. This includes four major river crossings. One bridge, the Benjamin Franklin, is designated as a top transit uh, asset that connects Philadelphia and South Jersey regions, as well as the PATCO line. The hallmark of protecting our 100 square mile territory is collaboration. <coughs> we work closely with numerous other police departments and municipalities to ensure the capital investments are consistent with current security and Homeland Security strategies. The DRPA and PATCO Police Departments were unified in recent years. The department has 150 sworn officers and two canine teams. Previously, when funds were available, we had strategically and successfully deployed Viper units or visual intermodal prevention and response teams on the PATCO line and stations. Currently, we routinely patrol the entire PATCO rail trans transit system. Through our Regional Transit Security Working Group, Parts Week, we have developed a robust public security awareness program with our award-winning Look Up, Speak Up campaign. This campaign engages the public through targeted advertising on both traditional and social media. Results are captured through the scientific polling by Zogby Analytics. The campaign teaches the riding public to observe what doesn't appear to be routine. Look up and either text, call, or email information and speak up to train transit intelli intelligence professionals for analysis. This is coupled with security awareness training for civilian frontline employees with the focus on education, educating individuals to be aware of suspicious activity and to report that behavior. One critical layer to our security is the structural and technological hardening of our infrastructure uh, since 9-11. Uh, the DRPA PATCO leadership has created a robust capital program which is dedicated to enhancing our security posture by hardening our subway and transit rail systems, communications, and our bridges. Another layer of PATCO security strategy is communication and intelligence sharing. At the federal level, we have an, an excellent working relationship with our DHS partners, FEMA, and TSA. We meet regularly and continually exchange information with regional partners, and we maintain and an outstanding level of collaboration to thwart potential attacks. 
We share intelligence with many law enforcement agencies on a daily basis through our Parts Week group. DRPA PATCO coordinates with the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force, the FBI Cyber Crimes uh, Unit, Delaware Valley Intelligence Center, the DIVIC, uh, the New Jersey Real-Time Crime Center, and many others. We've benefited from over $60 million in direct and regional support of our security program from the Department of Homeland Security since 2005. This funding was essential in creating a true regional effort to detect, deter, protect, and mitigate the threat of terrorism <laughs> against, our, against our, our regional transportation infrastructure. But this effort is far from complete. Physical hardening and regional asset integration must continue. Operational and sustainability efforts must continue. Investments in cameras, sensors, etc., must be protected by continuing maintenance programs. And digital records must be managed and stored. We need to continue reaching out to the public. They are surely the, the force that multiplier that, must be that we must continue to engage. And last but not least, specialized intelligence for transit partners in the center of gravity of this effort. Stopping those would do our riders would, would do riders harm before an incident is the best case scenario. Unfortunately, the trend of shrinking national grant programs has limited our ability to move forward with our capital security invest in mitigations. Since 2005, the national program is less than half funded. That means that projects that met all the criteria funding and were funded and executed several years ago are no longer eligible because the money is no longer there. We need to change this narrative and evaluate security projects based on their merits again, and not solely on whether there is enough funding to move forward. I am proud to be part of the proactive Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness DRPA PATCO team and help to protect the people who travel on our bridges and rail transit system, our employees and region in general. We have dedicated personnel who work extremely hard to ensure the safety of all of our stakeholders and the assets with which we are entrusted. And we look forward to continuing to work with you, our elected representatives in the House. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham, for your testimony. And uh, thank you for your service uh, with the FBI and, your, in, and in your current position. Uh, we definitely appreciate you being here today. Our second witness is Thomas Nestel, who currently serves as the Chief of Transit Police at the uh, Southeast, Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. Previously, Mr. Nestel was the Chief of Police for the Upper Moreland Township. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Nestel, Mr. Nestel to testify for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Cacto. Uh, Congresswoman Watson Coleman, Congressman uh, Fitzpatrick. Um, I, I count on the fact that the statement is, is part of uh, the record, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to read you that statement. I would like to amend one section, and that is uh, the paragraph regarding the special events that SEPTA <coughs> has been responsible for uh, providing service and add the um, upcoming uh, Super Bowl championship parade uh, that we'll be covering. <laughs> It's what nice like, to dream, Mr. Nestel. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> or should I say fantasize? One of the <laughs> uh, I, I think that everybody that's, that's uh, coming here to, to address you today and, and each of you understands that technology <clears throat> is the greatest need in mass transit. And second to that is grant funding. So I'm, I'm going to steer away from those two because I, I don't think that we can uh, more strongly emphasize the fact that those two are necessary. Uh, I want to bring to your attention a couple of other issues. Um, I, I'm a fourth generation police officer. I've been a police officer for 35 years. Um, when I got up this morning, I still love my job. I love being a police officer. Um, I, I think that, that the folks that are out on, on the line and working in cities and states throughout our nation are dedicated people who are challenged every day uh, with making the public safe. I have officers that, that I admire greatly who keep our system safe with a million rides a day. Um, I, I think that uh, I've learned that, that presenting um, complaints is less memorable than, than presenting solutions. So I, I want to be remembered. Um, I'd like to give you some, some potential solutions to problems that I've recognized in my jurisdiction. Uh, the first is the, the need for resources. Everyone needs resources. Um, I, I think that, that the Viper program was, was a wonderful program for us because the uh, Federal Air Marshals teamed up with our uh, officers and patrolled uh, high volume areas during uh, special events. 
Uh, I think that that can be expanded to a number of federal agencies that work in Philadelphia um, who could uh, supplement uh, our patrols during specific times of the day to provide a, a counterterrorism uh, uh, front. Um, we have to address crime control every day. Uh, we look to our partners to help us with terrorism prevention. Um, so that's the, the first. The second is um, communication. I know that, that every study that's been done and every investigation since 2001 says that interoperability and communication between agencies is very important. Uh, there are radios that, that um, uh, we purchased that have um, the ability to speak in every county uh, that, that we cover in Pennsylvania. That's five counties. Those radios are $8,000. Um, the, the issue that, that we've run into is that uh, jurisdictional um, uh, blockades are presented in using those radios in some jurisdictions because they don't want other police agencies uh, communicating on their band. Uh, I, think that, I think that the FCC could probably become involved and encourage um, multi-jurisdictional areas to be able to communicate on the same band if uh, the radios are available. SEPTA committed to purchasing um, several of those radios, so it, it wasn't even a grant uh, function, and um, yet we, we can't use it in some places. That's important. Um, the, uh, the third issue is jurisdictional issues. Transit agencies have a, a unique um, jurisdictional uh, challenge. Um, uh, during the, the Pope's visit, a high-ranking police official from a jurisdiction um, showed up at a, a pre-planning meeting and read a letter saying that the transit police authority uh, ends at the sidewalk um, and, and they do not possess police authority beyond that sidewalk. Uh, <coughs> that's not the kind of, of jurisdictional um, assistance that, that needs to be had in, in uh, policing and preventing terrorism. Uh, we need to have that ability for transit police to travel across state lines, to travel within county borders, and to have the same uh, police authority as the jurisdictions that, that are responsible for uh, protecting uh, that community. Uh, so those are, are three recommendations and three issues that I wanted to bring to your attention aside from the technology and uh, grant funding issues, and I'm happy to answer any questions. That's amazing. It's almost five minutes exactly. Not bad. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nostel, for your testimony. Um, we appreciate you taking time to be here today. Uh, normally, uh, I would continue introducing the witnesses, but Ms. Watson-Coleman, I think, would like to introduce the next two. And Ms. Watson-Coleman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next witness is Mr. Douglas Lomanowitz. Did I slay that? No, ma'am. Thank you so much. Mr. Lamanowitz is a member of the Fairleigh Dickinson University School of Safety Board. He also helps to provide analysis of school violence and school shootings of Homeland Security personnel. He is a New Jersey State Trooper and is currently assigned as a unit head for the Urban Search and Rescue Unit within the Emergency Management Section. Prior assignments were on the Technical Emergency and Mission Specialist Unit with the NJSP Homeland Security Branch and Special Operations Section through his specialized training, Mr. Lamanowitz has gained experience in special weapons and tactics, counterterrorism, methods, weapons of mass destruction, crisis preparedness, <coughs> and active shooters. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you. Welcome to your Thank testimony. You. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. <coughs> the New Jersey State Police is comprised of four primary branches, administration, investigations, homeland security, and operations. Through these branches and other specialized offices, the division maintains a network of information sharing and collaborative efforts to conduct effective operations. The members within these groups also maintain critical relations with outside agencies to promote abilities to counter terrorist and criminal activities in numerous critical infrastructure sectors and countless soft targets. Pre Presidential Policy Directive 8, National Preparedness, describes the nation's approach to, to preparing for the threats and hazards that pose the greatest risk to the security of the United States. National preparedness is defined as the actions taken to plan, organize, equip, train, and exercise to build and sustain capabilities necessary to prevent 
protect against, mitigate the effects of, respond to, and recover from those threats that pose the greatest risk to the nation. Through the guidance of PDD-8 frameworks, consideration must be given to enhancing and fortifying capabilities in preventing, detecting, and deterring the threats and attacks within the state of New Jersey. The threat of terrorism and the acts of violent crime has become too common in the United States, and New Jersey State Police assumes a great duty in defending the state against terrorist attacks and violent crimes. Preparedness is a shared responsibility and requires a whole community effort to promote safety and resilience through a common goal. It is vital that all partners build, organize, and enhance capabilities in a unified approach to build better prepared to counter all hazard threats in our communities. A mission within the Division of the State Police is to develop innovative strategies and partnerships with public and private entities to prevent, interdict, protect, and respond to threats that target our state. Through communal target hardening coordination, protective measure consultation, infrastructure and event vulnerability assessments, real-time data analysis, and situational awareness tracking, interagency communication, and direct <coughs> counter-threat operational deployments, our goal is to thwart terror. The Office of Target Harding was established in the Special Operations Section in the Homeland Security Branch in July of 2016. Their primary mission is to effectively implement and develop target harding strategies to deter terrorist activities. This office works collaboratively with other specialized groups within the division, as well as with other federal, state, county, and local mission partners. This is demonstrated in the monthly meeting at the Regional Operations Center, known as the ROC, where mission partner representatives assemble to discuss new intelligence, special events, current threats, lessons learned, best practices, and operational recommendations. These partners include, but are not limited to, the New Jersey State Police Threat Analysis and Critical Infrastructure Units, Joint Terrorism Task Force, Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, Transportation Safe and Security Administration, New Jersey Office of Emergency Management, and the National Counterterrorism Center. The New Jersey State Police is, <clears throat> excuse me. These daily, weekly, and monthly discussions are our cycle of preparedness, where we as a team of teams auto-adapt to the evolving <coughs> threat through collaboration, information sharing, intelligence, prevention, awareness, and response. The Division of State Police deploys target hardening missions regularly due to the, the shared network from our mission partners. The Office of Target Hardening organizes and directs New Jersey State Police units, which specialize in explosive and hazardous materials detection, suspicious activity detection and interception, counter assault tactics, maritime security, commercial motor vehicle and motor, motor coach safety, aviation surveillance and insertion operations, and highway transportation systems resiliency into target areas. This, also, this office also deconflicts with other agencies and specialized units in order to conduct safe, coordinated prevention and protection-based operations. Today's threat environment domestically and internationally is wrought with an ideology committed to the destruction of established Western culture. The world has seen a significant spike <coughs> in foreign and domestic terrorist attacks, resulting in death, destruction, intimidation, and fear. The United States is the ultimate prize for those seeking to strike a blow at our way of living. This ideology is evident in the rise of homegrown violent extremist attacks utilizing both complex and rudimentary means. As a state, we witnessed and responded to these types of attacks during the September 2016 New Jersey and New York bombings. The terrorist threats we face are only limited by the creativity and sense of purpose of those planning and executing them. In addition, law enforcement officers and military personnel have become a preferred target of those seeking to do harm. In order to be able to continue to detect, deter, prevent, and respond to terrorist and criminal activities, our law enforcement must, be, must continue to develop its capabilities. Collaboration and information sharing are most vital pieces that need to be nurtured in order to sustain strong relations. Stakeholders need to be able to train, equip, exercise personnel, as well as provide routine education to develop decision-making abilities. Our first preventers should be prepared with the institutional knowledge of the threats and practices in order to mitigate radicalization and immobilization phases before our men and women in blue encounter them as first responders. Counterterrorism and target hardening operations need effective means of communications and plans that are interoperable and standardized. The state of New Jersey lacks digital, techn digital technologies and personnel to support planning and operational phases and providing consistent real-time interagency communications 
during a multi-agency phase to an incident or an event. We collectively must continue to foster sustainable relationships, enable efficient information exchange, and implement an integration and analysis function to inform planning and operational decisions in order to protect our citizens and critical infrastructure in a unified approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lomano, for your testimony. We appreciate you taking the time to be here today, and you definitely have thought-provoking like the others have testified before you. Uh, Ms. Watson Coleman? Thank you very much for your testimony, and thank you for emphasizing the need to be collaborative and to interact, because Mr. Kako and I are constantly talking about uh, whether or not information is being shared in real time and if best practices and things of that nature have been. <coughs> Uh, our next uh, witness is Mr. Trusillo, Mr. Christopher Trusillo. Mr. Trusillo was sworn in as the Chief of the New Jersey Transit Police Department on July 26, 2010. He began his law enforcement career in 1978 as a municipal police officer in Harrison, New Jersey. In 1986, he joined the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey Police Department where he rose through the ranks to become the Chief of the Department. Chief Tusillo was instrumental during the aftermath of September 11, 2001, transforming the transit police into an anti-terror force. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Nessel for his testimony, and thank you for being here today, sir. Thank you, Congresswoman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I welcome this opportunity to appear before you today and discuss the challenges of securing passengers utilizing surface transportation in New Jersey, New York, and this region. <clears throat> As uh, the Congresswoman mentioned, uh, before joining the Transit Police Department, I served as the Chief of Department for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And while there, I was the commanding officer of the Port Authority Bus Terminal in Manhattan and Newark International Airport. And as the chief of that department, I was responsible for the busiest the aviation system in our nation, <coughs> as well as the bad system, where at that time, we moved 240,000 people a day between New York and New Jersey. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for inviting me. We appreciate the important role this committee has in matters related to transportation security and I and the agency look forward to working with you. Just a little background on New Jersey Transit. We're the third largest transit agency in the nation. We're also the nation's uh, largest statewide transportation system. Over, we encompass over 5,000 square miles. We provide almost a million trips a day. We have 257 <coughs> bus routes, 12 commuter lines, three light rail systems, and our paratransit system. We have 166 <coughs> heavy rail stations, 62 light rail stations in the state, and over 19,000 bus stops. Mr. Chairman, the transportation services provided by New Jersey Transit are vital to the economic well-being of our state and the region. We provide an essential service to the nearly 10% of all New Jersey, uh, New Jersey commuters who use and depend on New Jersey Transit. It's important to note that these services reduce traffic conge congestion by providing commuters alternatives to our crowded highways and transit crossings. Mr. Chairman, as you know, public transit agencies have unique security challenges due to the large numbers of people we serve in publicly accessible facilities, traveling on predictable schedules. Over and over, we have seen carnage inflicted by radicalized extremists on innocent people using publicly accessible spaces. <coughs> Just recently on a public bike path in nearby Manhattan, and unfortunately, mass transit systems worldwide continue to be a preferred target of terrorists. Our most important priority is keeping our customers and employees safe as we continue to provide essential transportation services. Safety and security are obviously the top priority for everyone in New Jersey Transit and within the Transit Police Department. Counterterrorism 
is this police department's number one priority, and we take that mission very seriously. New Jersey Transit utilizes a risk-based approach to our security efforts in all hazards and threats. The police department's intelligence section provides the agency with strategic level risk management tools in support of our counterterrorism efforts and coordinates intelligence collection, analysis, and production efforts, including reporting and monitoring of suspicious activity and in individuals. They work cooperatively and co collaboratively with the FBI offices in Newark, New York City, and Philadelphia, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, <coughs> TSA, uh, New Jersey Office of Homeland Security, NYPD and the State Police State Fusion Center. Mr. Chairman, members, almost all of our over 11,000 employees at New Jersey Transit have received security awareness training from conductors to bus operators to office staff. Our employees are force multipliers, extra eyes and ears for the police department. We also work in cooperation with the hundreds of businesses located near train stations to encourage them <coughs> to report suspicious activity. We also continue to work closely with those first responder agencies at the municipal, county, and state levels. To give you an example, several, several times a year, we take partner agencies to Texas A&M at a DHS Center of Excellence for <coughs> So we can train together for an event, God forbid, that may happen here at home. To date, we've trained over 600 New Jersey Transit employees from all business lines, not just the police, as well as over 500 of our partner agencies, some of whom are at this table today. And to assure that we're prepared and able to respond adequately to a terrorism incident, the Office of Emergency Management conducts five to seven exercises every year within the state with those partners. Our ability to respond quickly and capably has been enhanced further because this year we opened an emergency operations center, state-of-the-art operations center, which we've already used this past summer with the Amtrak work at a Penn Station in New York. The EOC provides information and support to incident management and coordinates all response and recovery efforts when there is an incident. <coughs> we, as my partners have mentioned, also promote our customers to see something and say something. We have uh, 800 lines, text tip lines. We also have a new mobile app that people can buy tickets and use a digital ticketing. And on that app, it gives them an opportunity with one press of a button to report something into this, our police department. Uh, while we don't uh, give out specific deployment uh, information about how we deploy our uh, police officers, we use, as my partners have mentioned, many different tools that are seen and some not seen to protect our passengers. We have specialized police officers who are all fully certified in urban search and rescue. Their skill sets uh, came to bear recently when we had the Hoboken train accident uh, in Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, we have explosive detection canines, which are probably our most important deterrents. Uh, and we're also a test bed for TSA's Office of Requirements and Capabilities Analysis, formerly Science and Technology. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, every one of these efforts that I have spoken of requires resources. We simply could not carry out our mission without the help and support of Congress and the Department of Homeland Security. We believe that increased federal investment in public transportation security by <coughs> Congress and DHS is critical to that effort. New Jersey Transit has made great strides in transit security improvements in the recent years, but much more needs to be done. 
So we are very grateful for the interest and focus of this committee and the subcommittee, and very grateful to Representative Coleman for her efforts. They are not only most welcome, they are essential. We look forward to building on our cooperative working relationship with the Department of Homeland Security and Congress to further <coughs> these needs on behalf of New Jersey Transit and the New Jersey Transit Police Department. I again thank you and the committee for allowing us to submit testimony on these critical issues. Thank you, Mr. Trisillo, Tris for your testimony, and uh, I appreciate you being here as well. Uh, the normal protocol at this time is for the, the chair of the subcommittee to start uh, with questioning, but given the fact uh, that Ms. Watson Coleman and myself work in such a fine and bipartisan manner, and given the fact that this is her home turf, I want to give her the honor of going first with questions. Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, thank each and every one of you for your testimony. I did read your testimony, and I'm very impressed with the kind of robust and comprehensive training that the people that work for you have not only those on the front lines, but even some of those who are in support uh, capacities. It just, it, it does make us feel better that um, these issues are being addressed. I have a couple of general questions. Um, one question, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to travel into other countries and to see what sort of security measures or technologies they employ in, in Europe and other places that would be very helpful to us here and very helpful to you that you don't have access to now. So I'm wondering if you could just quickly share with me some of those things that you've observed, if you have. And I'll start. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I don't mind answering that question myself also. Uh, I traveled extensively um, with, the, with the FBI and, uh, and what I noticed in most of the European, uh, as well as Asian, is that there's a presence on the platforms, absolutely. And in Europe, it's mostly an armed presence with canines actively walking and uh, patrolling the, the entire length. And it's not just one, it's multiple and they have teams. Uh, that's the biggest uh, that I've seen. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, they also have a, uh, a propensity for, for cameras. And uh, I just know that, uh, and assuming this position that I have now, the cost of maintaining them is also a consideration, and that's what sort of happens. You, if you employ cameras from 2003, 2005, they're pretty much outdated, and now you know are needed to be revamped, and uh, so it's a big cost. But that's what I've noticed uh, internationally is the presence on the platforms, and it's manpower. It's putting them out there, and meanwhile doing the other things that you have to do. Yeah, I think that if you go anywhere outside of the country, you see a very robust uh, camera network. We would love to have that. Um, that that doesn't exist for for most transit agencies. I think in in the United States right now, they also have things that that you don't see, and those are um, chemical detection systems on trains and on platforms, and also uh, scanners, weapon scanners. Um, all of that technology is being used elsewhere and is, is not as prevalent here in, in the United States. In, in many ways, our operations are there to support uh, the different sectors. So in terms of us looking at a transportation sector, uh, we come in as a, a deployment model, as a strike team to support the on-site. Um, but the cameras would be a big piece. And when we are there, we are bolstering uh, that effect <coughs> of, of having resources on scene. But when we're not, again, they're, they're at their, um, their minimums that they're able to sustain. Um, I would also recommend that digital, digital technology is continually uh, on the rise. And it's not just, if we could put members out on the platforms or in terminals and things like that, but it's the accountability of our members. So from a management side, so we, when you have a critical incident, uh, a catastrophic incident, that you know real time where your people are um, and because of the radio traffic just gets overwhelmed. So we are, in many ways we've come, uh, we've improved since 9-11 with our communications, but in many ways we haven't made it to that point. And there are some simple systems out there that other countries are using uh, and, and it's not being big brother and find, you know, where's my, my, my 
personnel, it's more of when something happens, how do we quickly get them and communicate to them what is going on? And then you have a real-time two-way feedback of that situation. Uh, I've had the opportunity while at the Port Authority to travel to London and to Israel to see how uh, they handle security. Uh, in London, the big dif difference that I noticed was uh, the camera system that my colleagues mentioned, very robust, very coordinated. Uh, all the disparate systems, no matter where they are, are tied in. So it literally is one system and it operationally is, was very good. Uh, in Israel, it's the mindset that everyone understands how important security is to, the, to their nation. And uh, that I took back with me, and that's why I mentioned earlier, <coughs> counterterrorism is the number one mission of every New Jersey transit police officer. They have to know that, not because I say it, but because they're trained to that. And our training reflects that. Uh, the other thing that I, I noticed uh, in Israel, again, was the randomness of the way they do their patrols. The difficult thing uh, we deal with in mass transit is not having the people to necessarily cover everywhere we have risk. And none of us can afford, <coughs> nor do I believe as a nation, we can afford to put a police officer everywhere. But we should be able to, in a random way, have someone who's preoperatively looking at a target have a risk that a police officer is gonna be there. That they should not be able <coughs> to observe a target for a week and never have seen a police officer at that location because that's a very bad message to send to an adversary, that this is a very easy target. So I believe that was what I picked up uh, from being overseas. So it seems to me that both um, additional personnel, so that there's a robust <laughs> presence, obviously canines that can detect um, explosives and gases and things of that nature. Um, and so my question is, have you had a chance to review the sort of proposed budget and have any idea how it would impact what you think you need as, a, as, um, as opposed to what you would be getting in any of those categories? For instance, the budget proposes just reducing Viper teams to 18. Um, it doesn't even propose necessarily the kind of uh, support to the surface transportation facilities, um, the just sort of the grants that would help you to hire people and I guess get other things. It's gone from like 88 million and it's being proposed to 44 million. I'm gonna introduce a bill today that you know I'm <coughs> hoping that John, Mr. Katko gets a chance to look at and finds areas in which he can support because both of us are very interested in ensuring, and as well as Mr. Fitzpatrick, very, very, um, it's very important to us that these surface transportation facilities and infrastructures and uh, operations are given the kind of attention that TSA doesn't seem to be giving them now and that the resources don't seem to be there now. I, if I may, I, I can mention it very directly in two specific areas in terms of the decrease in the transit security grant program. You heard me talk about the training we do. And this training is critical, the drills, the exercises. You know, there's a saying that my colleagues and I all know, you don't want there to be a major event. All show up and that's the first time <coughs> you're seeing folks. You need to have these relationships, these, this collaborative working, uh, knowledge before you ever get to that scene. And through the drills and exercises that we're able to do, and the only way we do it is through the Transit Security Grant Program, where we train together. Uh, we travel to a specialized facility to train together. These relationships are incredible. I'm gonna go back just for a quick moment to that Hoboken train accident. 
We had over 350 people on this train when it crashed into Hoboken. They were all extricated from that train, evacuated from that train in a half hour. There were 107 injuries in that incident. They were all triaged and transported to hospitals in under one hour. In emergency management, that's a remarkable job. And that happened because everybody who responded to that scene has worked together before, has drilled together before. The second item that would be critical and we would not be able to do what we do now if we lost the grant program my colleague uh, from uh, SEPTA mentioned it earlier, special events. For instance, transit, we have a train station within 100 yards of a football stadium. We have 16 football games every Sunday. Uh, NFL, AFL, every Sunday there is a game. And we have trains that go out to that stadium that we have to protect. We have concerts, festivals, fairs, they're all targets of opportunity. They're all where large crowds gather. Without the ability to put officers as a deterrent at these events, we're, we're vulnerable. And uh, those are two specific ways that a de decrease in that grant program is going to have ta a tangible impact. I guess um, uh, one question I have is to what extent do you rely upon the local police to participate in whatever need you have in securing your surface facilities at events, at special events, or just you know under normal circumstances? Because that particular program is is slated for elimination, and we think that that's particularly problematic. Anyway, I I think that. Um I think that police departments and local jurisdictions are already stretched thin and have way too many responsibilities, which is why we ended up being formed in the first place. Uh, they, can't, they can't assume uh, the responsibilities that, that we are responsible for. Uh, the gaps that exist because of the grant funding decrease from, from nearly 200 million to 80 million is, is very painful for, for the transit agencies. Um, we have, we have a, a significant canine uh, explosive detection function. And, and Congresswoman, if, if a bag is left unattended, if we don't get to that bag quickly, we have to stop the system. This happens every day. So we have multiple canine units throughout our system that can respond within minutes to clear that bag to make sure that it's not a threat. Uh, for, for us at SEPTA, we have a special operations response team, which is um, uh, basically a SWAT and rescue team that was funded through the transit uh, grant program. We're not getting those funds now. So it, it has a dramatic effect on those specialized functions that are so important to transit right now. <coughs> We will, we will be happy to do so, Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you very much, and thank you all of you gentlemen for being here today, as I said earlier. Uh, as I was sitting here, I was thinking, you have 12 and a half times the number of passengers that travel on the airlines every year. And not only do you have the safety and prevention aspect, you also have a law enforcement aspect that they don't have to deal with at airports very much. That is the unruly passenger, uh, uh, the, uh, unruly crowds at Eagles games, um, things like that. So um, the, you ha you're really wearing more than one hat, and I really commend you for the job you're doing. It's quite remarkable, uh, given the, the, the target of opportunity that, you daily, that daily presents itself in your realm, that you've kept people as safe as you have. And our nation really owes you all a debt of gratitude and all your colleagues. So we want to thank you for, uh, for all you do to keep people safe every day. Um, one thing I learned when I was a federal organized crime prosecutor is that task forces are critical. Task forces of federal, state, local law enforcement are the force multiplier you need to really draw on the expertise and the manpower issues to uh, get the job done. So it's really heartening to hear how well th that, that concept works. Uh, and it, it seems like necessity is a mother invention. And everyone knows you want to keep people safe. So it's a lot easier to get them to work together under those circumstances. But that's really very important. 
Uh, one thing that I was concerned with in my days as a prosecutor was the interoperability issue with radios as well. Uh, we had a lot of those concerns, and I, I heard that from, I think it was uh, you, Mr. Nesto, or it was, I, yeah. Um, I, I'd like to hear a little more about that and how we can help fix that, because to me that's, that's an, that, that should be an easy fix, um, and uh, it's frustrating at times to me that uh, when, uh, you know, not all law enforcement agencies were on the same frequencies, and it's just maddening that we can't, maybe we can't fix something as easy as that. So I'd like to hear something we could do to fix that, first of all. Um, I, I look, the, uh, Congressman, the, the technology is there. It's expensive. Um, and once it's expensive, it's, it's getting over the hurdles of jurisdictional acceptance. Um, when a different jurisdiction is speaking on your radio band, it's the different languages, it's the, the control of those, those conversations, it's access to information. You know, there's always a concern when, when your radio communication is being monitored by others that, that you don't know. <coughs> so there are, there are um, obvious hurdles that, that have to be uh, crossed before we can have that ability to communicate. During an emergency, we have interoperability where we could plug in from, from SEPTA headquarters, we can plug in all the local jurisdictions onto one band to handle that emergency. It exists, we have it. Um, this, is, this is the normal day-to-day -day communication. You, you know, a suspicious person in a track area uh, between Warminster and Hatboro in, in uh, Bucks County um, would, would warrant a communication with that jurisdiction. And, and we would have the, the ability to just switch a radio band, and the officers responding would then be on the band of that jurisdiction who is also responding. That's a huge benefit for us, huge benefit. Um, so it, it would be cost, and it would be uh, logistics of, of acceptance. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to add to that? No. There's a, it's called Statecom which uh, most of all our agencies across the state, as well as all local and municipal county resources can all jump on. Uh, we're in a process right now uh, in trying to identify certain channels. And right now, so like a, a target harding channel, uh, where it's made up of different agencies and they're going around with Viper teams um, and, and other groups in a over and covert capacities in a prevention and protection-based model. Not response, <coughs> prevention and protection. So that's the collaboration part, but how do we talk? And it's, it's through these, these group channels. Um, it's not taking ownership of another agency's primary, it's just giving an opportunity that they can quickly click over to this channel and speak. So in terms of a uh, special event, uh, the PAPL uh, two years ago, we operated off of Statecom, Super Bowl, Statecom, all these different special events. Now you think of a significant incident when you think about the seaside and, and the, the, uh, the bombings in New York, we were able to now move to a statecom channel to now collaborate all resources onto that. The, it's, it's a, to now it's a point of <coughs> education and training and exercising and everybody get comfortable in using it. But said it does exist. Okay. Uh, and one, sure. Um, one follow-up. Um, uh, manufacturer. Uh, there are several manufacturers of radios, and, and what we've seen is uh, that when we try to integrate those systems using different manufacturers, there's often a, another hurdle that, that comes up that there's a concern that there will be um, uh, communication interference or, or not uh, a smooth transition using different manufacturers. Mm -hmm. I'm not a communications expert. I don't know if that's a, a realistic concern, but I know that it is an organizational concern. Okay. okay. Now I'm gonna just uh, briefly touch on canines. It, it's amazing in this era of modern technology, which I want to get to in a moment, that people often get back to saying canines are one of the most effective methods and tools we have in our arsenal. And it's also amazing to me how little they're really utilized. So does anyone want to kind of share some opinions as to why that is, that canines aren't more, more readily used? I won't speak to why they're not used. I'll reaffirm what you mentioned, Congressman, about how important they are. I believe that it's probably the single best deterrent that we could have. We hear that all the time in the in airport realm as well. Isn't it amazing? You asked me what we can do to protect, with the singular thing we could do to protect mass transit, I'd say put a canine and a trained partner in every train station. And I don't think you'd have a better <coughs> deterrent than, than that. Okay. Anybody else? We've, 
we've used uh, the canine dog. When we shut down the bridge or we have a race that uh, is, is being, be, being uh, run, um, like Lark Run or, or one of the other ones, uh, we searched 7,000 bike riders' bags with those dogs and were able to get them down to, to the shore uh, before they arrived. I mean, 7,000 bags, uh, so irreplaceable. And I think that it, it cuts the uh, needs for staffing because ordinarily you would have a two officer team. That dog serves as, as a partner. It also serves multiple functions. It's not just um, explosive detection, it's uh, tracking of, of uh, escaping persons. Um, it is community relations. Um, it, the dog has, has multiple functions and a dog is much cheaper than electronic technology. <coughs> Does the same thing. Yeah, Captain Scott, Scott Poulton uh, in the audience, he uh, was pretty much one of the supervisors uh, in building this task force, this uh, detection render safe task force uh, for the canines. You know, it's, it's statewide capability uh, in recalling in a preventative or in a response function uh, for a special event or incident. But as everybody here at the table has said, uh, they are a phenomenal resource. And many times it might just be seen that they're scent tracking, a, uh, you know, trying to find a suspicious item. But in many times, if you start to think about the tactics that they are using overseas now, it's not just a, an article of an item, it's an individual, it's a vehicle. And what we're finding now is we have to adapt, and that's gonna require funding and training and exercise to now adapt to our threat and that's a moving vehicle. That's a moving individual. We don't have air, you know, scent trackers that are moving with an individual. They they, <coughs> they come onto an article or an item and they they scent it, right? Uh, but in terms of a moving subject, our, our canines across the state at a local, county, and state federal level, they are they still need that extra training. Um, so that that is a huge piece for our future in combating any type of terrorism. Okay. Yes, sir. Three words. Funding, training, exercising, mm -hmm. essential. How about a fourth word is savings in the summer sets in compared to like technology that you're gonna try uh, that, that may not work. And now let's get to the technology bit a, a, a little bit. Uh, I'm con constantly frustrated. I, I think I might share the sentiment of my colleagues when I note that Homeland Security is not the best at procurement and it's not the best at getting technology to the front lines. And I'll give you an example. We're at an airport in, in Amsterdam where they have American-made technology, 3D scanners, that are being implemented now. Now, they're on the front line, they are working now, they're, they're using them now. And uh, the Homeland Security Agency wants to study them uh, and they're in, in, uh, until 2019 and hopefully get them online by 2019. In the meanwhile, the technology is probably gonna advance because the bad guys are always advancing and we know that what it takes to even bring down an airplane is getting a smaller and smaller device. So. Uh, with that being said, um, is, is there any one thing that we can get Homeland Security to do <laughs> uh, to, to get, help you get the technologies to front lines quicker other than money? Is there something in the process that's flawed that needs to be ad ad addressed or adjusted uh, that, that we're missing? Because we're constantly on them, but um, it just seems to me that they can't get that process going in a timely manner. I mean, Ms. Watson Coleman and I were at a refugee camp on the border with Syria. And each refugee got $28 a month. And they never got the $28 a month, but they had the $28 voucher. And they would go into like this collective grocery store, 85,000 people. On the Syrian border, in the middle of the desert, middle of nowhere, they used American uh, iris scan technology to detect who was using the money and how much was left in their account. And we don't even use that at airports today. So with that being said, anyone want to share any thoughts on that? I have one thing. Uh, uh, we have 732 cameras on either the PACO line or on the bridges. Uh, integration, they're not integrated. I mean, what's the sense of having those cameras? Who can monitor that many? The ability, the analytics, is, the capability is there, but the integrative factor of intrusion detection and <clears throat> alarm systems and, uh, and the cameras themselves is essential. And uh, uh, so that's something that I'm looking forward to trying to, uh, hoping the grant program and that's why I brought uh, Mr. Uh, the Grant Man Shanahan along <laughs> with me to, to, to just force this, uh, this situation that funding is essential and integration is essential and I know that uh, 
the timing is now, and this is a, a key thing for all of us, now on a regional level. Gotcha. Right? Congressman, I, I don't think anybody at this table is going to say that technology isn't one of the <coughs> biggest pieces for securing mass transit. It truly is. I don't know where Homeland Security is testing it, but I'll tell you that I'll push my peers out of the way and volunteer that it be on SEPTA. Um, we, we all need this, this technology. <coughs> it's expensive. None of us can afford it. Um, we look forward to the time where, where uh, the, the tested opportunity um, becomes a reality, but it, it just doesn't seem to happen for us. You know, each one of these agencies spends its own dollars to, to move forward with technology now rather than wait until, you know, that five, that ten years later when it's going to be at the point where we really need it. Because in five or ten years, it's going to change. Right. Um, like the TSA does the innovation lanes at airports, but I don't know if they do much in the way of innovation, innovation with, res with respect to surface transportation. That's perhaps someone can get them to go with. But the bottom line is when the ideas are there and it takes so long to get them implemented because of their internal processes, that's very frustrating for us. <coughs> so. Mr. Chairman, as I mentioned in my opening <coughs> remarks, New Jersey Transit, we volunteered to be a test bed for science and technology, the division of within TSA. And we've been working hard with them, testing things like ChemBio detection, undercarriage screening, for instance, when we had to safeguard uh, rail cars for the Super Bowl, it was bomb detection, and we can get in the car and we could visually see the exterior of the car, but we were worried about the undercarriage. So they developed an undercarriage screening that at speed could read the underside of the rail car <coughs> to give us a level of comfort before we sent that car within the secure perimeter to the state police. So they are making some strides, but it's frustrating because those strides are coming very, very slow. Yeah, I'm not a science guy, but I believe technology has got to be the answer. And unfortunately, that technology is apparently not here yet. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's, the problem is a lot of times it is here. It's just not getting implemented in a timely manner. So, well, uh, do you have anything to offer? In making the transition in my career from uh, urban search and rescue to special operations, and as a former uh, special operations op operator, and now as an operations officer and coordinator, um, the main thing is to go by the KISS me method, right? And it, keep it simple, and for me, keep it simple, stupid. So it, it, there, every, all, of our pers all of our personnel are being tasked probably more than they, they can. It, it, they're being do more with less. And for us to try to keep up with technology and d deploy it the way we would envision it, what we see in the movies, and it's, it's, not, <coughs> it's, it's not practical. But in terms of I mean, going back to communications, so and not talking prevention based, but talking about a response incident, you, they're on the rails or they're in some type of terminals, and they are now the, the immediate uh, actors, you know, counter assault uh, personnel. They're trying to deal with the threat. How do you bring in the other <coughs> the resources that are needed? And we have actors now that are calling in SWAT, you know, SWAT incidents, uh, swatting. Uh, instance to see how we respond to make you know to now try to what are they what if we, how can we counter their capabilities so it's very important us to look at it in terms of making it very clear across all channels of the, the <coughs> communication aspects of radio but how can we use digital technology to make it very simple in terms of what is happening right now and then when you have additional resources coming in how can you provide a GS a GIS layout of what the area of operation is to make it very simplified, <coughs> the immediate point of contact. The very simple things, and from there, these men and women are trained in their tactics, and they can handle it. Thank you very much, and I went well over my time, so I won't uh, ask any more questions in the second round, but Mr. Fitzpatrick, the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, welcome to the region, and uh, to the ranking member, thanks for hosting us in your district, and thank you, all of you, for being here. Uh, number one, thank you for what you do. Uh, I know it's not easy. Um, it's a very, very uh, significant responsibility under diff difficult circumstances, so I want to thank you for that. And also thank you for testifying today because the recommendations that you share with us are very, very important. They become part of the congressional record, for one. And second, we really do take these recommendations back to our committee, back to the floor of the House, and they do, in some form or fashion, um, influence the, the final product, which 
is relevant to keeping everybody safe here in this country. I want to touch on, on two issues. Um, number one is interagency cooperation. Um, I formerly was uh, Mr. Cunningham's colleague in the Bureau, and um, I know he can attest to the importance of task forces and the role that they play. Um, and it's not just state to state, federal to federal, but it's federal to state. Um, I can tell you that in, in the area of um, Safe Streets Task Forces, Bank Robbery Task Forces, JTTFs, the synergy that was developed, um, not only the camaraderie and the relationships, but everybody brought something unique to the table. Every single agency on different levels had something unique to offer to those investigations. And when we talk about force multipliers, I think that all kind of plays into that. Um, Technology is important, canines are important. Uh, we talked about the force multiplier aspects. I think task forces are really important, which gets to my question. Um, for task forces to work, the relationships have to be good. And we all know, and this isn't unique to law enforcement, it exists in all sorts of organizations, but oftentimes there can be um, competitive jurisdictional battles, uh, sometimes uh, battles over funding um, that can um, hold back the success of task forces. So my first question is, what can you share about what's working and what's not working in the respective areas that you work with the task forces on both the state and the federal level? Uh, and the second is when it comes to the budget, um, oftentimes it's an issue of prioritization. Um, and a lot of times those edicts come from, from the top of the executive branch and they may or may not be consistent with what um, you all are seeing based on you having your ears and eyes to the ground knowing the threats on a more um, intricate basis than maybe the people at the top that are making those decisions and issuing the priorities that impact your funding and where it's going and what you can and can't do in, 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 uh, in keeping us safe. So um, if we could just address those two issues, the task force and, and sort of the, the relationship aspect to it, um, and second on is there any um, disconnect between the priorities that um, sometimes are issued on high that affect the priority of where your funding streams are going and whether that's there's a disconnect between what you really need. Well, first the the uh, the task force for 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 us kind of thing is our is our working group uh, for Thomas Dell and myself and the Dart team. The uh, we also have New Jersey Transit and, and and part of is part of our our group, the regional group. Um, that works tremendously well. I will say one thing though. I found out that we had funding for two analysts uh, who were working at the DIVIC and providing transit, transportation surface uh, work as well, you know, uh, processes and, and intelligence threats uh, they were working on. Uh, that grant is running out, and so we're not going to be able to fund it anymore. So those two analysts that were working and doing some things for us are now not going to be there. We spoke to the people at the DIVIC and the commanding officer there, and uh, they're going to try to pick up that. But again, that there's a there's a gap that, that causes there. Um, working together and uh, cooperatively is fantastic as as far as uh, uh, as, as I see, and, and the, the openness is there. Uh, it's it's what do we need? And, the, and we get back to the same thing: it's funding, it's direct. <laughs> You know, directed patrol funding. It's, it's money to put uh, systems in. It's to integrate it. It's to to make us better. You know, uh, jointly, and that seems to be what is lacking. Um, mainly the funding, uh, the the camaraderie, the the ability or the willingness is there. It's no longer a uh, uh, divided field, if you will. Uh, if I need something from the New Jersey State Police, I feel very comfortable that I can go there and get whatever it is that we need intelligence-wise or whatever. So i open it to Tom. Yeah, I, I'm going to piggyback on exactly what you said, Congressman, and that was the, the value of task forces beyond just the investigative function that they're serving is the development of the people that you assign to that task force is huge. Um, the personal relationships that they develop in that, that federal organization, uh, state organization, local organization, um, the, the uh, uh, added resource. I know that I can call um, the detective on the Joint Terrorism Task Force, on the FBI Violent Crime Task Force, on the DEA Task Force. I can call any of those detectives and immediately get resources from those organizations because of our participation and because of the relationships that are built. 
when it comes to the, the transit group, this transit group, um, we have a phenomenal relationship. And, and you know, uh, it might be a case in other places where there is uh, sparring over, over grant funds. That doesn't occur with our group. There's, there's great collaborative effort um, when it comes to the grant funding and the, the um, group efforts. But, but Charlie hit the, the nail on the head. Somewhere above our group, um, one of the most important parts of preventing terrorism is the intelligence element. You know, if we're relying on that cop on a, on a platform <coughs> to stop it, um, then a lot of things have failed to, to get to that point. We no longer will have an analyst after, after January. And, and that was funded by grant funding that we all agreed on, and, and it's gone. The concept of the task force uh, is what gets the job done. Um, I, I've seen it with the USAR task forces. I was involved with that for seven years. Uh, when, when a local or a county re, you know, entity needed a, a good resource, they called the USAR task force in the state, usually task force one. Now, in terms of operations, we have a bomb task force. We have a canine task force. You want the job done. <coughs> Now we're in the process for the last year of building. It's not called a task force yet, but we are t essentially a planning task force that is built up at the Rock, where you have all these en entities and all these different agencies and offices coming together, sharing intelligence and trying to develop a strategy to combat terrorism. It, in itself, it's a planning task force. And then that is what now gets put into the operational theater of how can we, through operations, prevent and detect and deter. I think in terms of the task forces, I agree with Charles. In the South, uh, it's very good, and you heard the chiefs talk about it. In the North, uh, the regional chiefs task force with the transit <coughs> partners, NYPD Transit, New Jersey Transit, uh, Amtrak, uh, Port Authority, the MTA. Yeah, I've been in this business for a long time, and I've been in the transit business for a long time. And I remember when TSA was stood up, and those were difficult times. That was a headbutting time, I gotta tell you. Thankfully, uh, we are beyond that, I believe. We are working together and cooperatively. That, that's the good news. <coughs> to your first point, Congressman, about the prioritization, <coughs> uh, I'm very worried about that because transit agencies are not well heeled. We all know the economic troubles that all transit agencies have. And when you're trying to move people, your top priority every day, things will fall by the wayside. But my colleagues and I, our job is safety and security of those people who are using the buses and the rails. And uh, we can't necessarily look at the budget and say, well, we're not going to put somebody there because we can't afford to put somebody there. If the situation and the intelligence dictates that somebody needs to be there, they need to be there. Uh, the grant funding gives us that ability to put that officer there. Without that grant funding, we're putting people <coughs> So beyond, uh, and I think everybody, not just on this panel and, and on the base here, but in the room, probably agrees that funding is the priority. Um, beyond that, what is it, and this is a tough question, I, I acknowledge that, but um, beyond the funding constraints, what is it that is frustrating when you're out um, doing your job every day? What is it that's holding you back? What, is, what are the causes of frustration beyond the resource issue? I think uh, from my perspective, and you touched on it earlier, we all deal with uh, other issues. In transportation facilities, we see a very high level of homelessness, drug addiction, mental issues, and we cannot say that our primary mission is counterterrorism, therefore we're not going to deal with these issues. We have to deal with those issues. And when we're dealing with those issues as best we can, we're being taken away from that primary mission. So that's frustrating, that in certain cases there aren't the services available to treat those with addiction, with 
homelessness issues. The mental health issue uh, is probably the biggest uh, problematic issue. People that come back day after day after day that you can't seem to move away from the transit facility to get them the help uh, that they need. So that's my biggest frustration. I'm, I'm jumping right on that. Homelessness, poverty, and the opioid crisis are what, what takes up all of our time during the course of the day um, and, and um, redirects our efforts from crime control and, and terrorism prevention. Those social ills are absolutely <clears throat> the thing that, that are most frustrating for us. Just to change the, the tone of that, uh, for us uh, and for transit, it's traveling against jurisdiction. It's the, the ability to smoothly transition from location to location. Uh, our officers cover in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Uh, and I think that's a, a factor uh, that, that weighs on the sign kind of thing. <coughs> We don't have necessarily the kind of issues that they're mentioning there, but one of the things I, that needs to get out is that, and I think uh, Mr. Pacello said it about what happens in Israel, everybody feels like they're part of the solution, that they're all contributing, you know, no matter they're a, a, a store clerk or you know, working at, as a police officer or a military person. They all have the same goal. Uh, we try to put that out through our PSA kind of information, but if it came from like a national kind of method as well, like to foster that uh, attitude that you're, because when I ride the train too, even though we want them to look up and speak up, and we want them to see something, say something, nobody's looking up. They're looking at their phones, and the message has to be somehow we get it to them through that through that system, or but we got to get them to communicate too. Well, I want to thank you all for sharing that, and I think it's a reminder to, to us up here that issues we deal with outside of the Homeland Security Committee are very relevant to what we deal with in the Homeland Security Committee. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, and uh, I, I happen to chair the Mental Health Task Force, and uh, I think. You'll probably, I'm not sure you even know this. What's the number two cause of killer, cause of death for people 24 and younger? Suicide. Number 10 cause of death for all Americans is suicide. And for every suicide attempt, there's about 22, every suicide is about 22 attempts. And you think about the cost of society and how little is being spent on mental health in this country and, that, and the crisis that it is. It far outstrips the opioid crisis and look what that's doing to our country. So just, we should all keep that in mind going forward. But uh, Ms. Watson Coleman is going to have the last word here. So, Ms. Watson Coleman, you are. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, Mr. Fitz Fitzpatrick, for coming here and Mr. Katko for holding this hearing. This has been very illuminating, and I thank you very much. You've been very helpful. Um, Viper teams is something that I don't know because I'm a dog lover or what, but I recognize that they're vitally important. And in the piece of legislation that we are proposing, I am proposing today, it does in include a significant increase in those teams somewhere upwards of 200 dogs in, in that situation. Um, <clears throat> thank you for raising those sort of cultural uh, issues that, that also impact uh, your ability to do your job and uh, made me think about the budget and what could possibly happen as a result of, of some of the proposals that are taking place, including these, this tax reform proposal and what it might do to those people who are homeless, you know, who are, who are addicted and uh, who are impoverished. It certainly makes their life a little bit more difficult. Last thing is that um, I just wanted to ask you this question. What do you have to, to say about um, sharing best practices, knowing, knowing whatever information exists that can help prepare us for things like what happened with that, um, that truck <coughs> that ran into those bicyclists? It concerns me because it doesn't take a lot of education, it takes no education. Obviously, it takes no core value. It doesn't take any training. It just means that you were, you're hell-bent on uh, killing somebody. So these sort of automobile-related uh, uh, terrorist attacks weaponizing our cars and our trucks. If you have anything that you would like to share that we might be thinking about 
as we move forward in what we need to do. And that is my only last question, other than to thank you. Anybody? I'll, I'll take a stab at that, and it deals with my trip to Israel. And this was post 9-11 in 2005, where everyone, everyone was aware of the possibility of terrorism. And my host said to me, Chris, I can't believe that in America you're not doing more of this. And I said to him, Nikki, as horrible as 9-11 was, it would take many more 9-11s for Americans to give up their freedoms. And I think we're torn as a nation between giving up our freedoms and dealing with this specter of terrorism uh, that keeps tapping on our shores. And I think we just, as a people, need to be more aware. It sounds simplistic, but we need to be very aware every day at all times of our surroundings. And that sounds very simplistic, but unfortunately, uh, I believe that that's where we are in society today. It's kind of connected to that national message you were talking about. Um, say something, see something, say something, yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Packer. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm a fan of education, um, and you have your frontline men and women, um, and many times in terms of what they, they gather through their own experience. However, there is a way of, of changing that mindset from a first responder to a, to a first preventer, and that is through education, um, not just the experience. It, it, we can always chase TTPs. <coughs> tactics, techniques, and procedures. And, and sometimes, you know, you have a couple of hits of the same type of tactic, um, and Ramayo will be published, the, you know, the ISIS magazine will be published, and they're pretty much telling their people how to put it out. And now you'll see it, you know, being conducted, the same type of tactic in each country, including here in the United States. Um, it comes down to education. There's a program now, CTCs, the County Terrorism, Counter Terrorism Coordinators. So it's trying to get down from a federal down to a local level um, and educate them in terms of what are the best protective measures. So when you talk about a, a train platform or you talk about a special event, no matter what the theater of operational area is, they know what the best means of, hey, how do I create a strong perimeter? And the reason why, because of these vehicles, because of these suicide bombers, because of what they could potentially bring in. And it's, it's that. So. Uh, that's something that, again, it's, it's developing, but it always needs support, and then that is edu providing education across all, from federal all the way down to local, and using these county terrorism coordinators as that mechanism to branch out to these counties. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, just one point. I, I totally agree with what the <coughs> lieutenant said, and uh, uh, terrorism is asymmetrical now. I mean, very asymmetrical with, with the advent of domestic terrorism homegrown kind of things. Um, so I do believe that that kind of, that it's, it's a constant <coughs> training because the methodologies and the methods that are being employed, now we have to plan for uh, hotel rooms and apartments and parking lots above us to be looking out for whether it's gonna be an, an active shooter, if you will, uh, from above. With it, So everything has to be changed and, and you, we have to adjust on the fly, and all the officers have to adjust and learn from, from everything else. And it's important, the, the sharing of information, best practices, things like that is essential to our business in the transit and transportation uh, industry. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their testimony today. It was excellent. It was very thought-provoking, and it gives us a lot of things to talk about and go back and take a look at what we can do to further help you in your mission to keep all of us safe. So we want to thank you for that. The members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to these in writing. Pursuant to committee rules, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days. It's my pages. Uh, before I adjourn, I just want to thank once again my colleagues from uh, the local area here, Mr. Fitzpatrick and Ms. Watson Coleman, uh, for putting this on, and Ms. Watson Coleman in particular for your leadership on this one. Uh, it's a very important issue. Uh, we spend an awful lot of time looking at airports and air travel, 
but this is not another huge area that we need to make sure we pay attention to. So thank you both very much, and with that, the committee stands adjourned.